cogent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I am Jamie Masters, and I am so grateful to have the amazing Daryl Lyons back on the show. He runs Pax Financial Group. You can actually check it out, paxfinancialgroup.com, and he has a special landing page for all you EM subscribers, so make sure you do slash EM for that. He's also coming out with a brand new book that you should definitely pick up called 18 to 80, and we'll go into what the heck that's about in just a second. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. I, I love being on this show. It's fun. Thank goodness. Phew. I do do a good job so far, at least on your side. Hopefully everyone else likes it too. So so tell me about the book because when you told me the, the name of it, I was like 18280. Is that like in 1800? No, tell me tell me more about what the book is. Yeah, so it's 18 to 80, everything you need to be doing with your money from age 18 to age 80. And uh, just working with thousands of people in the middle class with their money over the years, I just collected all my blogs. And then I rooted the content in something called behavioral finance, which is a collision of traditional finance, finance psychology and neuroscience. And I thought as I built out the book, I need a chapter. Every chapter is designed to help somebody at their specific age. So there's a chapter for 18 and 19 all the way to age 80. And they're very short and sweet, but just to get you exactly enough information to help you with your money. I love it. It's a perfect college gift or right before college, right? I wish I had that stuff when I was younger because I was doing all the apparently wrong stuff. Good to know. Um, what made you actually write that book? Well, I just needed to help people. Frankly, I just see an issue with the middle class. Um, in 1975, our savings rate was about 17% and today it's at three and a half percent. And so that presents a problem and, and we don't have less information today. We have more information. So mm -hmm. there has to be something different that we have to do. And, and what it is, is we have to really start changing the way we behave with money. And if not, I, I really see a problem with um, down the road retirement issues and Social Security solvency for the middle class. And so my heart is really with the middle class to help them make better decisions. And this was the best way I could help them. And if you look at the content of the book, the way it's designed, if somebody's let's say 50 and they digest to age 50, maybe 49, 51, then they can say, okay, I need to help my, what would my son or daughter be doing at age 20? Or what would my mom be doing? It Should she be doing it at 70? And so it allows them to have a guide for their money. Why are we saving that much less now? Well, it's a good question. And I'm going to suggest that it's marketing. Um, today, if you go into an appliance store, um, they'll, they'll put in fresh apple pie smells and they know that sales will go up 23%. Then if you take away any friction of buying today with one swipe or even optical purchasing or debit cards, we take away the pause and the friction that used to be in our purchasing. So it's just, we don't even think about buying stuff anymore. And then we wake up and we're completely broke. I can't say anything about me. I was in 70 grand in debt. I remember having, I froze my credit card. I ended up cutting them up, but I froze them because they said like, well, then you'd have to thaw the ice in order, but now it's in my computer. So <laughs> it's saved. It's really easy nowadays. Way too easy. And McDonald's makes uh, $3.50 more per transaction than they did when we had to cash and break a 20. And these marketing companies, they're just absolutely brilliant. And we are, we're, I mean, I'm part of this group. We're middle class. My money, I tell my wife, I go, we pass by Target. I go, that's where our money dies. <laughs> and, you know, it's just crazy. You go in there and you're like, I just spent $175 on what? And, and, and that's just everyone all the time. And then we have no money to save, no money to give, and no money to pay down debt. And my daughter is obsessed with Target. I don't want to go in there because I know I'll pick something up. Okay. So, so oh, yeah. it reminds me of, um, I made my kids do this a long time ago. Maybe I should do this. The marshmallow test. Do you remember the marshmallow test? Right. So, yeah. so what can we, and just to explain it to everyone, it's you get, you get one marshmallow, either you can eat it now, or you can wait a certain period of time and you can have two, right? It's all about that, that patient side of things. My kids used to do that. But now even me, I'm going, ooh, my tolerance to patience is so much lower than even when it used to be when I was getting out of debt. So tell me, tell me more about what we can do to make the great, the better, I should say, choices. Yeah, it, it, we really, it starts with, in fact, this is uh, the, I think it's the first chapter, maybe the second um, on in the entire book because it's so important. And it's adding a pause to our purchasing. It's a simple strategy, but just adding a pause, the more zeros involved, the greater the pause. I had a 
a friend who wanted to buy a truck and he was, he didn't have the money to pay cash. And so, uh, it was going to be $700 a month and, and he was ready. I mean, he loved this, this truck. It was an F Ford F-150. It was beautiful. And I said, let's, I went to the lot with him and I said, this, this is beautiful. Let's just sleep on it. And he wasn't ready. Of course, neither was the salesman. Right. And so he slept on it and that was a year and a half ago and he still hasn't purchased it. And so I don't know if you've ever had a situation where you've been able to pause and just say, you know, as a result of pausing, I didn't make a purchase. But that happens once you start to develop that habit. It, habit, it happens a lot. What goes through his head? Though? So if he wanted it and was ready to sign on the dotted line, what made that go from one day in a second to a year? Every day he's making that choice again not to get it? Or how does that work? Yeah, I think what he did, what he does is at the time, of course, there's um, – you know, when I when I made some mistakes, I'm, I bought a very expensive BMW when I did, couldn't afford it, and the smell of the leather just created some n- new senses in my body, and and I had this dopamine burst, right? And I'm like, all oh, right, let's do this transaction. And then once you settle down, then you start to um, take that information and align it with your values. And you can't do that in the middle of emotion because emotions hijack hijack the brain, and you get this, you know amygdala hijack and you just you're just focused on that transaction but when you step aside you say you know it's really important for me to have in his case have the free cash flow to um, invest money in his little ranch for his family so he was able to say it's more important to align my values with my money than to make a transaction but we can't do that in the middle of the chaos of the amygdala the amygdala hijack well and it's funny when you know your values it's way easier but i think when it, it's tough when it gets Squishy, like I, I still have a Honda CRV, and the kids make fun of me. They call it the mom mobile. I don't care, right? And the kids' school, they go to an entrepreneur's kids' school. There's yellow Lamborghinis, and everyone has a Tesla. And I was like, I don't, I personally don't value cars, so I don't totally care about that. So it's easy for me to remember that. Other things, though, I, I, I don't have that, right? Amazon purchases, click go. So, so how do we really start pulling out our values that aren't really apparent when we're making buying decisions? Well, it's a good point. You know, there's some value exercises a good coach will help you with. Um, and, and so there's some value exercises that I tend to do with my clients. I'm not a coach, I'm a financial advisor, but somebody like yourself may be able to help somebody pull out their values. Um, and then if the decisions are bigger, then um, I suggest adding a filter to all decision making. And, and I have I have about 10 filters I use, kind of I pull them out as I need them. But one filter that might help um, a lot of your listeners is this. Um, did I ask a child, a friend, and a sage before I made this purchase? And the reason that's important is to ask all three is a friend certainly should know you better. And a sage, somebody with wisdom and experience, but a child, if you're able to articulate it in a way that you can communicate it, then it's oftentimes you've you've been able to understand it better in your mind. If you can't articulate it to a child, then you don't really know yourself. And so that one filter is a tool that can help you make better decisions. How do we make ourselves do that, though? Because exercises are wonderful when you hire a coach and they make you do it. It's another thing when you're going, I, I really want this right now. <laughs> I know it is a habit. What's good about uh, what what I do know for sure is we have something in our brain called uh, it's it's a transaction that occurs called neuroplasticity, and our brain does form neural path new neural pathways, and it does change the basal ganglia, their habit forming part of our brain, to where if we do this enough and keep doing it, we keep keep doing it, we develop this as a muscle, and it becomes habit forming. So it may start out as a hack. And you need to create some hacks. Like I have a hack right now in my life because I, I tend to, I'm a, I have a company, right? So I tend to exert myself. So my hack right now is to count four seconds before I'm ready to explode. Um, but I told my coach, I said, I want to turn this hack into a habit. And so a part of it is, is you've got to do it and create a pause. But once you do this enough, you will create new neural pathways and it'll become a habit. Okay, I love I love the neuroscience behind all this. Now that we're learning so much about the brain and, and talking about the pathways and knowing what you want is a new pathway is a wonderful thing and going after it is another. So how are you specifically bringing up that four seconds? Like, do you forget often? Do you always remember? Do you have a padlock that shocks you? Like how, how do we know to, to be able to do that every time? Yeah, so I... Um... I do a couple things. First of all, I, I've created habits over the years. Um, for example, I have a, a, a checklist every week that I follow. And a part of that checklist, uh, it starts on Monday, 
it's the things that I'm trying to do to improve myself. So every Monday I go to my checklist and it's just kind of a rhythm and things that I may have forgotten about. I go, oh yeah, it's time to, I didn't do that last week. I need to do it this week. And so I have a Monday morning checklist. I've always had it from eight o'clock to nine o'clock. I go through my checklist and it's the things that I'm working on. That's awesome. What, what is, what's on this checklist? I love this idea. Especially oh, well, if you me, actually use it because a lot of people will like start a checklist and be like, oh, you're right. I forgot about that completely. Yeah. So it's in this binder here and, and um, you know, I have um, I I actually pray for everyone on my team. That's a, that's a part of what I do. Um, I, I have um, I send thank you cards, handwritten thank you cards. And then um, I have to check. I have to check our financial status as a company, check our cash flow. Those are just a handful of things on my checklist. And you do it on Monday morning. So why Monday morning? Why aren't you like getting into email and trying to get through stuff? Why eight to nine on Monday morning? It's really important to reflect um, on what I need to do. And I do actually reflect on the, the prior week and, and I send an email out to my team. And it's called GTD. And I tell them what I get to do this week. It's not an obligation, what I get to do. And then I tell them the high of my last week and my low of my last week. And that just helps me to improve and communicate and to be vulnerable with my team. And everyone on my team, there's 18 people, they all respond back with their GTDs and highs and lows. And it's just a rhythm. And uh, I get to know them and stay abreast of their lives. Wow, is that is that a one-on-one? -on -one? So you send it out to everyone and then they reply privately or are they replying to everyone? They're welcome to reply privately if it's intimate or they can reply all. And, you know, sometimes there's some stuff that they just need to unpack with me one on one. But many times they reply all and we just kind of walk life together. 18 emails of all the people, but you must get to know each other. Are you virtual as a team or are you all? We have one North Carolina office, but most of us are in San Antonio. We've got we've got some uh, I guess I should say we probably have two or three virtual, but mostly in San Antonio. Oh, wow. And the fruit is, I'll tell you a couple of fruits. It's, um, I'm glad you asked about this, but we've been one of the best places to work in San Antonio for multiple years and an Inc 5,000 company, one of the fastest growing companies in the country. And I only say that not to brag only because when you stay engaged on a, if you have a rhythm of staying engaged as a leader, um, those are the results. And I'm really proud of that. Not because it's anything that I'm doing. I just really want to stay engaged in their lives. And I think that sincere curiosity should be played out by most leaders. Well, and so we've talked about leadership too before, and I think we need to highlight it even more because what we just what you just talked about is a tactic that works really well. But I think you've got the whole strategy even even more on the leadership side. Can you dive into that a little bit more on how you really? Because a lot of the owners that I work with don't have any experience in being a leader. So not only are they running a business, they're also trying to learn how to be a leader, and it, they're different. It is, yeah. I I I study leadership, and I. One thing that I and I study leadership maybe from a different angle. I I'm infatuated by the biography of leadership. So I've read about 36 different biographies on presidents and um, and I just you know, I was I watched that. And there's an incredible Netflix documentary on uh, Julius Caesar. And if you look at it through the lens of leadership, he's he there's moral compass issues, but there's some neat things there. And I, so I think what I'm my point in that is. Um, if you want to be a leader, uh, I would suggest that um, you be yourself. I'm just in the midst of learning about leadership, trying to be anybody else is a foolish exercise. But um, be be genuinely curious about what makes somebody great. And you can you can siphon through some of the mess. But how do they make decisions under pressure? Um, you know, interesting kind of going back to some of the uh, investment stuff. This is an interesting st statistic um, when it comes to investment performance. Um, only 13% of results is from investment selection, um, market timing, and asset allocation, how you allocate your money. But 87% of investment results is decision making. And that's the same thing with leadership too. Even though we may not be the smartest person, we may be the most insecure person, we may not be the best work ethic, but if we've started to create good decisions, then we increase the probability we'll have a good successful outcome. How do we do that then? I know. And that goes back to creating some of those habits, uh, changing the, the neuro pathways. And um, I think having a rhythm, uh, like I said, starting Monday morning, Monday morning, eight o'clock, that's what I do here. Now, at six o'clock is, you know, that's my quiet time. I spend time just uh, in solitude. And you can look at the track records of successful leaders. I mean, they do things and there's some some stuff that they do. You know, they work out and there's some habits they have and, and trying to pick those things and add them to your inventory, but in an authentic way. So when we talk about decisions, and this is, I, I find this fascinating also, because we are, especially in this day and age, bombarded by even more decisions. Same thing with the financial side, like what do we buy versus what do we not? But as a business owner, it's times a million, it feels like. And yeah. so how, 
Um, do you feel like decision making is an individualistic piece? Like, do some people listen to intuition? Like, what do you do to get better at making decisions? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, gosh, that's a good one because there's the intuition piece. Uh, and and I know that I'm not making a political statement here, but I did read Trump's biography and he said, I don't like committees because committees are pe for people who can't make decisions. <laughs> and I think about I go, you know, sometimes committees have helped me not make a bad decision. Now, I will tell you um in terms of really creating that, I, I can't stress enough having, I, I have coaches and I have a, a community of people that I, I just say, I don't know. And I try to lean on intuition as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also try to lean on research and then you have to make some judgment calls. Now, good business people, I will tell you always assess the downside exposure and quantify it. And as a result, I've done that for years. And I think it's a, it's a model that people can duplicate when you quantify the downside exposure and accept that that's a possibility. I then think you can move into making a decision. See, it's, it's also depending on what type of personality you are, right? So I'm a researcher and one of my um, mastermind members, he's a, he's a risk guy. He will go through all the, the downsides and all those pieces, which I think is an amazing, wonderful thing. But how do you not get stuck in the oh crap, there's so many reasons why not to do this. And then if you make the decision, the second guessing, there's just so much oh involved gosh. in it. There is. Yeah. I think there's wisdom in the council of advisors. So having a mastermind group is really important. How do you, well, what if your coach says one thing, your mastermind says another, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here, but I think it's really important it's, because nobody has the answers to this, right? Yeah, you're right. I, I, I've been stuck in some of those decisions before. Um, uh, you know, and, and when we're actually we're having conversations now with zeros on them, like, OK, do we merge with this company Do we acquire with this company? And there's so much different. You know, some people, somebody, somebody told me the other day, why would you mess up a good thing? <laughs> like, just don't mess it up. And then I have another group saying, oh, it's a great opportunity. And you do. I mean, you spend some time going crazy and then and then you have to make a decision. You just have to make a decision and you don't know if it's the right one or not. And I've done that so many times and I've made some bad ones and, and I made some great ones. But you do you end up saying, OK, I've assessed it. I've done the best I can. And now it's time to make a decision. When you make that decision, what's the level of commitment to? Because it's like, do you put a timeline on it? Like I'm going to make a decision by this date and time or I'm going to try test it for this long. We're going to see if I like it. How do you figure that piece out? Yeah, usually I have a time frame on it. Um, a lot of times when I'm doing my planning for next year, um, so I'm already doing my 2019 planning. Uh, <laughs> my, it, 2019 planning, I, I have on my task list ideas that, okay, this goes in my 2019. So what that means is that 2019, I'm going to be thinking about some strategic decisions on how we grow as an organization. And so 2019 will be my year of just kind of gathering information this year 2018 was implementations of decisions that i thought about the previous year um so it's always kind of i'm, I'm kind of thinking ahead on, on in, in terms of what we're going to do and, and not reacting to stuff that comes at me wow is it a psych because i notice even in my clients there's some we're planning in august we're planning 2019 and i and i know the ones they're pre-planners i love it right other people are like and this is late, quote unquote, to some people, but December, like, oh, shoot, now I get to go do this, right? Do you do you do it in a cycle where you have a year of, of this is what we research and plan and then we have a year of implementation or that, that sounds amazing? Yeah, so it's usually a year of, uh, well, let me say it this way. I usually gather enough information to then be able to make a decision and then I have an implementation strategy. Now, the key to the implementation strategy is that if I get new ideas that will um, interrupt what we're trying to accomplish. I put those as a future idea. And so that kind of so I, I'm very focused. I think one of the key, you know, Bruce Lee said uh, a successful person or a great warrior is an average man with incredible laser like focus. And so if I am implementing anything, then it's always uh, done with extreme focus. So new ideas that come my way, they go in planning of next year. So how do you know when to pivot then? So let's say you're going down the path and you're like, I'm committed, but then you get new information. Do you change things? Do you not? How do you make that decision? Very rarely do I yeah. change. Okay. Yeah. I know. I know sometimes. And I tell you what, it's so easy to get new information that will shake you up. And, and that's not uncommon. And you have to anticipate uncertainty and embrace it in the middle of making decisions because it comes at you and you've got to be committed to go through that. The people that push through that are the ones that accomplish great things. Those that stop at that uncertainty because of 
some type of information, they actually never accomplish great things. So the great leaders push through that. Thank you for saying that. So bringing that up, I, I chat with many, many business owners, right? And what's interesting is the stuff that is more comfortable, this is what I found anyway, the stuff that's more comfortable, like they can jump over those walls because the walls aren't that tall. But as soon as they run into a wall that's really tall, they're like, oh, I need to I need to go over here. Oh, I need to go, right? But there's walls everywhere, people. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> no matter where you go, there's walls everywhere. And so trying to figure out how to how, how to stay committed instead of, Switching is huge. So the fact that you do that, have you always been that kind of guy or is it something well, that you've learned? One time long ago, there may be some, uh, there may be something inside of me, but a long time ago, a guy told me uh, if there was a wall, he said, go ahead and buckle your chin strap and put your head down and just bust through it. I go, okay. And so that, that became my attitude. And the other thing he said, as I waffled a lot, um, as trying to develop this skill set, um, he, he also mentioned, just burn the boats to your other alternatives, just burn them. And I found that those two were relieving and um, I just committed to just, I'm going to bust down that wall or I'm going to burn the boat. It's kind of phraseology I use in my head. So you actually do that. Cause that's the other piece. It's like, okay, well, I'm supposed to focus on the positive. Yay. Right. But you're like, I got burn the boats, right? There's nothing else we can possibly do. I can't go back. I'm stuck and sitting in potentially a puddle of mud or whatever it is, wait, waiting for that push through. How do you get like in your head, how do you get through that? Because it's tough in your own head when you're sitting there. Gosh, I mean, it's not. I mean, it's scary. Um, you know, did I make the right decision? I'm going back and forth. I'm waffling. Um, but you really do. You know, if you again, I think if I know some people, they're just incredible at their intuition. They just go right. And then no, no regard. I but what I like to do and Jen Worth did a good study on this. They just recognize that those do, that do um, planning that actually sit down and critically think through and plan, um, they're much more confident in the execution of that plan. And so, so all I can tell you is that I would be pretty poor at overcoming these walls if I didn't have a good amount of preparation. Does that make sense? Oh, a million times over. Awesome. So then how do you prepare? Like, what do you specifically do to do that? Yeah. So I'm just gathering information a lot of times. Um, and so, you know, some decisions that we are looking at next year, whether or not mergers and acquisitions make sense for our organization. Um, and, and we're identifying that I'll be spending some time identifying people who have done that and I'll start hanging out with those people. Um, you know, I take inventory of the people I'm around and start spending time with people who've done it. Um, I'll, um, I'll find myself joining organizations so I can learn more. So it's a sincere curiosity and I'll spend a ton of time doing that. I did that about three or four years ago. Um, how do you grow? an organization at a reasonable rate of return. And so everything associated with Jim Collins, I was eating up for an entire year. I could not get enough of, and that helped me prepare. So it was, it was surrounding myself with the people reading stuff, podcast, just digesting everything I could to then um, have enough information. See, that's awesome. And putting it as a priority to start putting your time and focus and attention on that before it's necessary. Cause that's the other piece. People are like, well, I need to know now. And then they make decisions fast, right? And they're like, oh, I think it's good. But that's where the planning, like you said, that's where they go, oh, did I make the right decision? Maybe I didn't have enough information. And then that's where the waffling can throw you for a loop, right? That's exactly right. And kind of going back to that study, I don't want to stress that enough. Those that did good planning were more confident in the execution. Mm -hmm. And imagine being lack of confidence in the execution. Then you're going to waffle and you're going to lose a lot of money, time and resources just waffling. Yes. You know, I, I think it for me, I'm just kind of, maybe I'm just scared of getting in the middle of it and waffling and I wouldn't be able to handle that very well. That's why I prepare. So, but anyways, I do it and it works for me. That's a highlight. I'm like, oh, I felt waffling. Oh no. Yeah, no. That's a, thank you for saying that because I think everybody needs to hear that, especially if anyone listening is in a waffle state at the moment. Okay. Waffles yeah. are not always tasty. Okay. <laughs> so let's go back to more of the, the money side. I know um, you're talking a lot about retirement and business owners kind of go, eh, I mean, I'm going to, I'm working on this though. I'm so focused on my business that they sort of just throw in like a SEP or just sort of throw it back there, hoping that that's going to be good enough. What, what resources do you have for us to help with that? It's a great question. I, um, you know, obviously, um, I'm an owner of a business here. My dad is, my mom is, my sister is, I just have owner conversations like this all the time. It's so important to save 15% of your gross income for, um, stocking and deciding. It could be a set before one K and IRA, what it is, but you just have to do that. I can't stress it so much. And you can be the best entrepreneur 
and the smartest mind to make the best decisions. But if you own a hardware store and Walmart opens up next door, you're toast. And so I have seen over the years, I've been doing this since 1999, um, smart business people just still focus on their business, but just kind of sock away 15%, wake up at 60 or 65 with options of a business that they can sell plus cash reserves. And I got to tell you, I'm thinking of a client in particular who did that. She was brilliant. She was in real estate and um, she's just loving life. She had, she's officially retired, but I would call it, I don't like to even call it retirement. I like to call it pivoting. She has now pivoted to the next chapter where she can do what she wants and actually give back to the community the way that she wants, because not only did her business sell, but also her assets and her liquid assets were, uh, had accumulated to a very, uh, several million dollars. How do you recommend business owners put that away? Should they do it monthly, weekly? Should we only be paying attention at the end of the year? Give give us some tactics because yeah. that's the thing. If if someone sees it in there, they're gonna they're gonna be like, oh, you know what? I could invest in more Facebook ad or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Well, no doubt your return on investment is gonna be your business. Um, and don't rem- don't forget this. The best portfolio is an undiversified portfolio when you're right. So what I mean is, is that your best, my net worth, my best return on my investment is my business. But what if things turn out regulatory or whatever? So, yeah. so saving 15% is really important, but tactically speaking, the way I, I encourage entrepreneurs who are still launching their business is to save an amount that they're comfortable committing to monthly, just minimum at 50 bucks. I don't care what it is. Just get in the habit. And then as they get higher uh, distributions, then pop that catch up, just put, put some more back in there. And so, especially in the startup phase, that's really good way to just minimum amount and then every quarter, quarter catch up. And then before you know it, you'll get into a good rhythm and it works. So it's already creating that habit. Like we were talking about before. It's a habit thing. Really it's behavior. It's habits, behavior, habits. I can't stress it enough. It's not math. Uh, it's, it's, it's behavior. Yeah. And sometimes our brain thinks that it thinks it wants something else. But long term, people, it's the marshmallow test again. Later, you're going to be way happy that you put 15% away. That's awesome. Okay, so give us, I know we have to start wrapping up in just a little bit, but I <laughs> give us some more on, because um, one of the things that you wrote in here, which I thought was really important, how to handle big things that come up. So handling aging parents when you're a business owner, how do you handle all these things? Because we're still humans running a business and trying to deal with our finances. So what do we do in regards to some of that stuff? Aging parents is an epidemic right now. I'm seeing it all the time. It's the number one issue that hits my desk. And it's the boomerang of bedrooms as well, where a divorced daughter comes in, moves in with um, a middle-aged woman. And then this middle-aged woman's running business with dealing with aging parents. It is is just so difficult. You're not alone. Anybody that's dealing with this and dealing with aging parents, uh, it is really everyone collectively. Um, That's why it's so important. and, And I can't stress this enough for anybody in your community. I've did a lot of research on um, what happens to retirees when they transition out of retirement. And uh, the reality is, is there's two things that is absolutely critical to push through some of these challenging times. And one is purpose, having a unique purpose that God has given you as a result of your life story and embracing that. And the second one is community, having people, people around you that are dealing with the same thing. Even when you touch somebody, the oxytocin that comes to you just by hanging out with people, Purpose and community when you're dealing with all this stuff is critical to push through and get through the other side. Yeah. I mean, I didn't even, so when you say once they're transitioning from retirement, which it doesn't, like my parents were just retired, like just retiring. And I didn't even fathom the fact that, yeah, eventually they're not going to be like that anymore and something might happen. You know, my dad goes, eh, just put me out in the woods and shoot me. That's what my dad says, right? Lovely. Texan. Great. He's not even Texas. He's from Maine, but very similar, like middle of nowhere in the woods. Right. But, but, and you know that that's not true, but what we do is we, we also don't want to look at the death thing. And so therefore all, even if you're not dealing with it right now, we all die. We all get old. We all have issues, especially with what's coming up now. What can we do as, as business owners to prepare for that? Even if it's not right in front of our face right now. Yeah, I think what you want to do is have this phraseology in your head, prepare for the certainty of uncertainty. (laughs) Um, It is uncertain and we can't, you know, we really don't know what's around the corner. This next breath that I have is a gift from God. So I'm, I really am preparing for the certainty of uncertainty. And so that means you have to protect yourself buying the adequate amount of life insurance, disability insurance for business owners, ID theft, 
umbrella policies. Mm -hmm. uh, those are all important components for those that are younger. You got to get that stuff. It's very important. Those that are older have to consider long-term care insurance and you got to make some business decisions on whether or not that makes sense. And so you have to go through an exercise to kind of think through that. Yeah. And I won't go too deep into that, but, but long-term care insurance and stuff like that is a whole topic in itself. Do you, do you have a good subset of resources for all that stuff that people can take a look into? Yeah. So I have some videos out there. I think, I, I think you find them on YouTube. I'm producing more and more because people are hungry for, again, information is one thing. Leadership is another information hasn't worked since 1975. So I'm trying to provide some leadership and, and so some YouTube videos and some website resources, I'm, I'm producing as much as I can, as fast as I can, but long-term care, so important to make a business decision on whether the insurance makes sense or it doesn't make sense. Okay. And we'll link everything up. And of course they can chat with you or chat with whoever their, their main person is on some of this stuff to make some of these decisions. Cause it's tough to go it alone and be like, I think this is a good idea, but I'm not totally sure. And then they waffle, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. I, I deal with it every day. <laughs> yeah. I can only go you. Thank you for people that care, <laughs> care in the industry, not just about the, the revenue and the money that you're going to get from the people from selling stuff, but actually care about them as humans enough to make the videos that make a difference too, which is really awesome. No, I, I'm called to do this. I, I feel very, uh, very call to really help people make better decisions with the money, specifically the middle class. Uh, I just feel like there's a lot of pressure on our middle class in America, and that's creating, um, it's, you know, it's it's the leading cause of divorce, you know, and, and, and it's leading cause of anxiety and depression. And so if I can move the needle a little bit there, I think I've done my job while I'm here on earth. I love it. All right, we have to start wrapping up. So I'm gonna ask the last question. Now that we went over everything and waffles and all sorts of fun stuff, yeah. <laughs> what's one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? Hey, you know what? I had a different answer, but since you led me down this way, I really think that creating that Monday morning checklist is is brilliant. And not because I created it. There was a great book called The Checklist Manifesto that talked about physicians who use checklists that they have less. Uh, surgical issues than those that don't have checklists. And so um, so I would suggest creating a checklist every week of what you were trying to accomplish and be consistent with that and update it as you go and get new information, but create that Monday morning checklist. I so appreciate that you said that. I read that book, but I did not create a Monday morning checklist from that. Now I wish I did. I would have been doing it until now. That's an amazing, great idea. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can we get the new book also for graduation presents or anyone else that needs it? Yeah, 18280, um, a simple and practical guide to money and retirement for all ages. Mr. Dave Ramsey gave it a great endorsement, so I'm really appreciative of that. You can get it on Amazon, of course, and then, uh, of course, you can get it at paxfinancialgroup.com uh, slash EM. We'll have a link there for your listeners. Thank you so much for coming on today. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that interview. And if you want to check out more amazing resources, I'm only curating the best of the best. Go check out eventualmillionaire.com. You can take the eventual millionaire quiz, figure out where you are in business and what you need right now. Plus you can look at curated resources specifically for you on the new start here page. I'm so excited. Please join us. Please let me know if you need anything at all. I'm here for you and have a fantastic day. Bye.